2094 BCE. Tis a lovely, sunny, bright day in southern Mesopotamia. The rivers flow as the crops grow. Hang on, is that the Gutians again? Looks like they've taken a trip down from the mountains and are being a bit cheeky. I say, Urnamu, me old mate, I think it's time to take the army and take care of them once and for all, don't you? Yeah, that's right, just go and take your army and then... Oh my god, he's dead. Well. Hey, Shulgi, up for some shenanigans? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you lads and ladies around the world. And welcome back to a now flourishing once again region of Sumer in southern Mesopotamia, where the city-state of Ur came to eclipse all others in the region, becoming its hegemon and uniting all of these city-states under its leadership. With Ur-Namu at the helm, the city-state of Ur expelled the Gutians from the region, however they were not completely defeated. Hence why Ur-Namu had to take his army and try to sort them out. However, he was killed in the process, leaving his son Shulgi in control of a stable and prosperous state, which is sometimes referred to as the Neo-Sumerian Empire. Like with most rulers as we will see throughout human history though, upon ascending to the throne a new ruler must consolidate his authority in some way or another. And this is exactly what Shulgi did. He continued the construction policies undertaken by his father, overseeing the final completion of the great ziggurat of Ur, upon which sat the temple of the moon god Nana. However, aside from continuing the building projects of Ur-Namu and ratifying and publishing his father's law code, the information for the reign of Shulgi for at least the first half of it is somewhat scarce. It's only in the 18th year of his reign that we get anything more concrete. For it was in this year, 2076 BCE, that Shulgi established a standing army for the Empire of Ur, one that he would use to go on an aggressive campaign of diplomacy and conquest across the wider Mesopotamian region and even beyond, even so into the east, into what is now modern Iran. For to the east of Sumer sat another developing Bronze Age civilization, that of a people who lived on the Iranian plateau whom you may have heard of already, known as the Elamites. And in particular, one of their city-states, that of Susa, had recently been moving ever closer into the Sumerian cultural and political orbit, despite being outside of the Mesopotamian region. And this city, for Shulgi, an ambitious king and would-be emperor, presented itself as the most tantalising of all targets. For Susa was a gateway city to the wider trading networks of the Iranian plateau and even into the Himalayas and the Indian subcontinent, most particularly with the Indus River Valley or Harappan civilization, which at this time was coming into a golden age of its own. More importantly, however, regarding trade networks, Susa sat at the gateway of what was at that time known as the Tin Roads, long trading networks that stretched back into the continent of Asia itself, providing a wealth of tin stocks with which to mix with copper. Of course, from those two, we have bronze. And with copper being such a readily available supply in this region, one element, tin, was not. For it is somewhat of a mystery where these early civilizations got such vast quantities of tin, but one estimate does place these tin mines somewhere within the realm of the Iranian plateau or the Indian subcontinent. And for this reason, Susa sat in Shulgi's crosshairs. And with the capture of Susa, Shulgi now had a new eastern frontier of which to defend, and he did this by securing diplomatic alliances with nearby Iranian city-states. 
which would help him to create a buffer zone between his new prize of Susa at the opening of the Tin Roads and the Uranium Plateau, within which some old enemies of the city-state of Ur and of the wider Sumerian region still roamed in these vast and yet untamed lands. Ah, but we don't need to worry about them. It's not as if people roaming around outside a city uh, taking a peek over the walls have ever wanted anything that the people within those walls have ever got. Ah, uh, he says hopefully with his fingers crossed behind his back. Anyway, Shulgi's conquests did not stop simply with the city-state of Susa on the Iranian plateau. Instead, with his eastern flank secure, Shulgi turned his eyes north towards the northernmost regions of Mesopotamia, where the capital of the Akkadian Empire had once sat. But more specifically, he focused his attention on the area that would one day house the mighty city of Ashur, later capital of the Assyrian Empire, 1500 years after Shulgi's demise. With these areas now in his pocket, Shulgi's empire now rivalled even that of Sargon the Great who had preceded him centuries before. And with the frontiers now handled and secure, Shulgi could focus on central administration within his realm. And chief among these administrative measures was the incorporation of these new territories on the frontiers into the Sumerian Empire, culturally, politically and socially. One interesting example comes to us again in the form of the city-state of Susa, which had been recently annexed by Shulgi's armies, and as I have mentioned before, was already culturally tied rather strongly to the Sumerian region, most notably in its language. For alongside a localised language known as Elamite Linear to us today, Akkadian cuneiform one of the written languages of the Mesopotamian region at the time had already been practiced within the city for a considerable while, which made it considerably easier for Shulgi to incorporate this wealthy city into his burgeoning empire. Furthermore, it seemed that Shulgi was somewhat of an ancient economist, for evidence has arisen of registry offices being set up throughout Shulgi's empire, which dealt mainly in the form of the collection and redistribution of taxes within the state. And a little thing to know about the economy of this early civilization is that currency and coin-based money systems were nowhere near the realm of invention or even thought. Instead, taxes were paid in kind, in that they were paid in physical goods, such as cattle, wheat, or copper or tin. These goods were collected and redistributed at these registry offices throughout Shulgi's domain. And it's within these registry offices that we perhaps see a very basic form of specialization and cataloguing with the goods produced from this tax system. For at a site known as Purzish Dagan, the registry here specialised solely in the collection and redistribution of cattle, with which an ancient form of civil servant would take note of how much cattle was paid, and these cattle would be redistributed to the lords, temples and peasantry who were due them in kind. And to keep track of this, Shulgi had eyes all over his vast empire, mainly in the form of military commanders loyal to him, who were based in a town, city or urban centre, tasked with the responsibility of making sure any local NC or lords did not rebel and gave anything that was demanded of them by the royal household to the centralised state in Ur itself. And as a result of this bustling administrative activity, extensive archives of cuneiform tablets have been found, each of them comprising what are essentially Bronze Age financial documents, with early economic records counting and quantifying all of these tax contributions to the state of Ur. And to calculate all of this, the Sumerians developed something quite ingenious indeed, something which echoes even into our daily lives to this very day. 
a base 60 number system in which everything was calculated into units of 60 and the genius of the number 60 is that it is a number divisible by many others making it much easier to calculate fractions and percentages of amounts, which streamlined the process of the redistribution of tax contributions throughout the Neo-Sumerian Empire. And in case you were wondering where this system is used today, look at your watch. Look at your clock on the wall. Every second, every minute, and every hour that we count is measured in units of 60. And with all of this put together, it seems that not copper, tin or bronze was the most precious commodity of Shulgi's realm. It was instead perhaps writing and mathematics that truly allowed this early civilization to flourish amongst the sands of the desert and heat of the sun. But as we are all too aware, all great and good things must eventually come to an end. And in 2046 BCE, Shulgi, the son of Ur Namu, and the great conqueror and ruler of the Neo Sumerian Empire, passed away, leaving the realm in the hands of his son, Amar Sin, who ascended to the throne in the same year, and who we will discuss next time. So if you enjoyed this video, perhaps consider leaving a like and maybe subscribe so that you stay updated on all the happenings of our world and its history as part of the Grand Portfolio. For now though, I'm Lewis of the Grand Portfolio and thank you for watching.